Well, hi there, and welcome to our Bible study on the Lighthouse Discord server. We're on the last two psalms in this section, and they're both, well, the first, Psalm 79, is about, it's an, a lament over the destruction of Jerusalem and a prayer for hell. And Psalm 80 is where God implored implored to rescue his people from their calamities. So I felt that they would go well together. But before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Holy God, Almighty Father, Savior, Jesus, how we love you and care for you, and how we know that you care for us in our deepest needs. We think of the one on our server today who has lost a close family member and the grief that is felt and the arrangements that have to be made and all of those things that would seek to distract us from our relationship with you and cause us to question because it hurt. And yet, it hurt you to give us your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. And yet you did that willingly, Lord. You worked out our salvation. You offer us a way out of our sin and our struggle. You truly are almighty God. So as we get into Psalm 79 and Psalm 80 tonight, we ask that you would be with us in a very special way. May our lives be truly changed. May we be renewed in you. May we be comforted in the midst of whatever life is throwing our way. For those who are in desperate financial need, and I know there are some who are, I pray, Lord, for your provision. I pray that through your Holy Spirit, that we would draw closer to you. I thank you and I praise you in your holy name. Amen. So as I said, Psalm 79, a lament over the destruction of Jerusalem and prayer for help. This is a psalm of Asaph. O oh God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. They have given the dead bodies of your servants for food to the birds of the heavens, the flesh of your godly ones to the beasts of the earth. They have poured out their blood like water around, around about Jerusalem. And there was no one to bury them. We have become a reproach to our neighbors, a scoffing and derision to those around us. How long, O oh Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath upon the nations which do not know you and upon the kingdoms which do not call upon your name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. Do not remember the iniquities of our forefathers against us. Let your compassion come quickly to meet us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name, and deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Let there be known among the nations in our sight vengeance for the blood of your servants which has been shed let the groaning of the prisoner come before you according to the greatness of your power preserve those who were doomed to die and return to our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom the reproach with which they have reproached you O lord so we your people and the sheep of your pasture will give thanks to you forever to all generations we will tell of your praise. 
May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. And before we even get into our commentary and our study, what really strikes me here out of this chapter is verse 9. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name, and deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. And that causes me to stop and think for a moment how we as a society, we as humanity seem to think that we deserve. We deserve good things. We deserve to have our prayers answered. We deserve God's provision. We deserve. But it's really all about God. So when we go to him and ask him to hear our prayers, to answer our prayers, we should be thanking him and asking him to do it to glorify himself and not us. And that causes me to pause my heart for a moment, to be honest with you. And I realize this is being recorded or I would just sit here silent. But you see, our relationship with God is such that he's here with us. Psalm 139 speaks to the fact that, you know, his hand is upon us and he goes before us and he goes behind us. But we forget that he is truly almighty God. And so therefore, he has the right to answer prayers in any way he sees fit. And because he's almighty God and because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, we have the privilege of going to him in prayer and asking him to meet our needs, whatever it might be. Could be healing, relationships, financial stuff, spiritual stuff, whatever it is. But Almighty God deserves all the glory and the honor. Now, I don't know if that causes you to take pause, but it sure did me as I was reading this. So this is written by the singing Asaph family. And it was written when further reflection on God's faithfulness in Israel's faithfulness as the city of Jerusalem lies in ruins. And the style of it was a community cry to God for his deliverance from the nations who had conquered God's people. And this psalm is recited at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem every Friday afternoon as a cry to God to restore his temple. And the psalm is also used in Jewish synagogue services on the 9th of Ab, A-B, a day of fasting to commemorate the temple's destruction. Interesting. So the history lesson that begins in Psalm 78 actually continues into Psalm 79, except now four more centuries of time have passed. See, at the end of Psalm 78, God had placed David's family on the throne and God's temple had been established on Mount Zion. But as Psalm 79 that we just read opens, God's temple, holy temple, was defiled and God's holy city was in ruins. So the lessons that God's people were supposed to learn in Psalm 78 were actually never taken to heart. And what happened was spiritual disaster. Now, Psalm 79 is also considered a companion to Psalm 74. In the earlier Psalm, Asaph took God through the streets of Jerusalem 
and pointed out, excuse me, the defilement of God's city. In this psalm, Asaph's concern is for the people of Jerusalem, for those killed and still unburied, for those taken prisoner, for those trying to deal with the terrible loss. Now, if you want to know more about the unburied, have a look at Leviticus 26.30 and Deuteronomy 28, verse 26. You see, the prophet Jeremiah had warned the people in Jeremiah 7, verse 33, 8, verse 2, and 9, verse 22, that such a calamity was about to fall on them, but no one believed that it would really come to this level of horror. And everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong. Been there, done that a few times. Maybe not everything, but a lot of things. But in this time, in this place in history, this is exactly what happened. And everything that could be destroyed was destroyed, which meant that every realm of life was altered. You see, in the political realm, the nation was destroyed. There was no king, no government, no police, no army. In the economic realm, the land was under the control of Israel's enemies who were intent on crushing those rebellious people once and for all. So there were no jobs, no businesses, no crops to harvest, no animals to care for, and no way to earn a living. And if you think that sounds bleak, think about the social realm. Families were ripped apart. Parents and children were dead or dying, and long lines of prisoners stood chained together until they were marched off to exile. And then, of course, there's a spiritual realm. The temple was gone. God's public worship had come to an end. The sin and rebellion of the people against God had come to its final disastrous consequence. Can you even imagine what the Israelites went through? And the only shred left for Asaph to hold on to was the unchanging character of the Lord God. And that's all that Asaph could appeal to as he called on God for deliverance. In verse 8, let your tender mercies come speedily to meet us. New King James Version. You see, Asaph couldn't use Israel's goodness as leverage or their unswerving faithfulness to God. Why? Well, they were guilty of iniquities and sins. And so are we, friends. Don't think for one minute that we're any better than they were back at that time. You see, Asaph couldn't plead for compassion from the conquerors because they would have responded with even more cruelty. The only hope that Asaph had was in the merciful nature of God. Verse 9, help us, O God, of our salvation for the glory of your name. Have a look at Isaiah 42, verse 8, and Ezekiel 39, verse 25 for that. Now, Marvin Tate wrote, how do the people of God cope with disaster in the face of God's seeming absence? The answer is by hanging on to hope in him. And friends, that's so true. When I say that we also live in sin, what I mean by that is we have a Redeemer, and his name is Jesus Christ. And when we become saved, when we know him as our Lord and Savior, we are made new. We're washed. Our sins are washed white as snow. But for some reason, most of us, if not all of us, seem to somehow struggle in our walk with God along the way. Perhaps we choose a life partner who's not a Christian. 
perhaps we make choices in how we choose to spend our time. Perhaps we don't have faith or whatever the circumstances are. And I'm not here as judge and jury. I don't mean that at all. But do you understand where I'm going with this, friends, is that it's so important that we maintain our faith in our God. And Psalm 79 played a key role in one of the most well-known conversions of the past 2,000 years. I wonder if everyone knows this. I didn't know this until I'd read it. A young Roman named Augustine sat in a garden in Milan, Italy, under deep conviction for his sin, and yet seemingly unable to break away from his old life of rebellion against God. There's an awful lot of us, I think, who rebel against God without perhaps even realizing. But in his longing, he prayed some verses from Psalm 79. How long, Lord, will you be angry forever? Do not remember former iniquities against us. Those are verses 5 and 8. And almost immediately, Augustine heard the voice of a child say, take up and read. And as he picked up an open Bible, his eyes fell on Romans 13, verses 13 and 14. Quote, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. That's New King James. And in that moment, Augustine believed fully in Christ alone and he was saved. And he went on to become a powerful Christian writer and church leader. Now, again, I'm not here as judge and jury, but I wonder if there is anyone in our study or anyone who listens to this down the road till YouTube pulls us off for whatever reason, if they ever do, I wonder if there's any of us asking, will the Lord be angry forever? And are we asking him to not remember former iniquities against us? For him not to remember former, iniqui former iniquities. Are we struggling in our walk? Are we making decisions that don't honor him? And I encourage you to go to Romans 13, verses 13 and 14, and read that and pray it. And ask God to forgive. Lord Jesus, if there's anyone listening to this study who is struggling in their journey with you, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would take hold of them this moment and that they would turn their lives completely over to you. Even if they've known you for a long time, sometimes we need a refresher. Sometimes we need to rededicate ourselves to you. And so I pray, Lord God, that you would help us to do that. In your name I pray. Amen. So we'll move on to Psalm 80. God implored to rescue his people from their calamities. And this, this psalm is for the choir director set to El Shoshanim. Eduth, E-D-U-T-H. And it's a psalm of Asaph. O oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your power and come to save us. O oh, God, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. 
O Lord of hosts, how long will you be angry with the prayer of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears, and you have made them to drink tears in large measure. You make us an object of contention to our neighbors, and our enemies laugh amongst themselves. O God of hosts, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. You removed a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground before it, and it took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shadow and the cedars of God with its boughs. It was sending out its branches to the sea and it shoots to the river. Why have you broken down its hedges so that all who pass that way pick its fruit? A boar from the forest eats it away and whatever moves in the field feeds on it. O oh God of hosts, turn again now, we beseech you. Look down from heaven and see and take care of this vine. Even the shoot which your right hand has planted, and on the sun whom you have strengthened for yourself, it is burned with fire, it is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man whom you made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you, Revive us, and we will call upon your name, O Lord of hosts. Restore us. Cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. May God add his blessing to the reading of Psalm 80. So this was Asaph's personal prayer. And it's a meditation on the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC, the southern kingdom of Judah, where Asaph lived, was spared, but her northern brothers were carried off into captivity. And the style was that this is a national prayer for God's restoration of his people. So Psalm 80 is centered on two vivid images that describe God's relationship with his people. First, Asaph pictured God as Israel's shepherd in verse 1. And if you want to look, I've got four verses to look at. Psalm 23, 1. Isaiah 40, verse 11. Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. And 1 Peter 2, verse 25. So, he pictured God as Israel's shepherd and then asked the Lord to lead his people through their present crisis, just as he had led Israel in, into the wilderness or in the wilderness. And the nation of Israel had split after the death of King Solomon. And so from that point on, the 10 northern tribes were called Israel and the southern two tribes were called Judah, the name of the larger tribe. Israel in the north moved decisively away from the Lord, and about 200 years later, in 722 BC, judgment fell. The powerful Assyrian army conquered the northern tribes and sent them into exile. That disaster is what led a member of Asaph's musical family to write Psalm 80 and to appeal to God for help. God, as Israel's shepherd, was called to rescue and restore his scattered flock. Now, the second image Asaph used is the picture of a vine. And we can look at Ezekiel 15, 1 to 2, Hosea 10, 1 and 14, verse 7, and Mark 12, verses 1 through 9. You see, Israel is the Lord's vineyard, and he's the caretaker. God had carefully transplanted Israel from slavery in Egypt to the abundance of the promised land in verses 8 through 11. God had done everything possible to nurture his people, and he was justified in expecting a bountiful harvest of spiritual fruit. Now, 
I was raised on a vineyard and I could go off on a tangent on this, but I understand this in a way perhaps that not everyone would. But Israel brought forth wild grapes in Isaiah 5 verse 2, and Jeremiah called God's people the degenerate plant of an alien vine in Jeremiah 2 verse 21. You see, the caretaker took careful pains to cultivate the vine, but the vine itself refused to yield good fruit. So God was left with only one choice. The vine had to be pruned and cleaned severely and basically cut back to a bleeding stump. Now, I will tell you, one thing I learned living on this vineyard, and we grew grapes, for wine, that was the choice my father made to sell to the winery. And that's how we live from the time that I was six and a half to after I graduated from college. But there was something that we used to call, and I can't remember the name. I want to say stickers, but that's not the right word. But they were, they looked like little shoots of grapevines and they would wind themselves like the leaves looked like a grapevine but they would wind themselves around the grapes but they were like a weed and essentially they would steal nutrients from the vine so those had to be removed but then you also had to prune the vine back because the, the end shoots that were new were, and I'm not talking about these, these um, stickers anymore, I'm talking about the actual vine, but you see they, weren't, they were new, but they weren't strong enough to bear fruit. So you had to keep a certain level of maturity of the vine, one, to feed from the soil, but two, to bear the weight of the fruit. So pruning was an absolute necessity on the vineyard. And in our lives, in our spiritual lives, pruning off things that would take us away from God is critical. If we want our relationship to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So God was doing that difficult work in the northern part of Israel, and Asaph realized that his own people in Judah were headed down the same path. So Asaph prayed that God would return and look down and visit his vineyard in verse 14. And he asked God to begin to restore the vineyard to the place of fruitfulness and blessing and obedience. So how do we pray? For people who are experiencing God's cleansing, chastening hand in our lives or in their lives. We usually ask God to bail them out. But maybe we should pray that God does a complete work so that they emerge from the experience more fruitful than they have ever been. And friends, I'm going to be honest. I see this in our prayer request channel. I see where people want help. They want God to answer, but they're making choices and decisions that are not serving the Lord or serving him in the way that they would like or that he would like. But they expect God to answer and deliver without making, without them making the effort. And I'm sorry if that hurts someone's feelings. I'm sorry if I'm coming across as obnoxious or rude or critical or judgmental. But I've been there. And we can make excuses until the cows come home. But until we're ready and willing to get real with God, there's only so much that he can do. So praying that God does a complete work for people is important. 
And Jesus used both the image of the shepherd and the image of the vine to picture himself. I am the good shepherd, he said in John 10, verse 11. The good shepherd gives life, his life for the sheep. And later in John 15, Jesus told his disciples, I am the vine, you are the branches. In John 15, verse 5, the Lord still prunes and cleanses the branches, not to hurt us or punish us, but to prompt us to greater fruitfulness. And that's what I'm talking about about the way that we pray for people, friend, the things that we speak to them, because we're part of God's kingdom as we abide and remain in the vine, which is him. And he produces spiritual fruit in us as we stay close to him. Now, Keith Hardman, in his book on revivals in the U.S., identified five stages of God's work in revival. The first, revival is usually preceded by a time of spiritual apathy and sinfulness. The second is a group of God's people become aware of their lack of spiritual zeal and begin to ask God for a new outpouring of his grace. The third is leaders arise who speak with conviction to the causes and remedies of the spiritual crisis. The fourth is an awakening begins affecting believers who are renewed and unbelievers who are drawn to faith. And the fifth is the awakening strengthens God's people for a future challenge or opportunity. Now, Psalm 80 was the cry of one man for a powerful work of God in reviving his nation. What stage are we in in our various nations? What will it take to move our hearts and our wills to that next level? John Wesley wrote this, a note in Wesley's journal, January 1st, 1739. About three in the morning as 60 brethren were continuing instant in prayer, the power of God came mightily upon us, insomuch that many cried out for exulting joy, and many fell to the ground. As soon as we were recovered a little from awe and amazement at the presence of his majesty, we broke out with one voice. We praise thee, O God, as we acknowledge thee, to be Lord. God, I ask for a revival on the Lighthouse Discord server. I ask for revival in our hearts, Lord. I am so tired of apathetic belief. And I'm not speaking about anyone in particular. I'm speaking about myself. Because I've been there too. I get tired. I've got a lot going on in my life. And I know that there's a lot going on in others' lives. And when we need most to turn to you, we fail to do so. We look for encouraging words. We look for light and fluffy prayer when what we really need to do is get on our knees and on our fall on our face before you and surrender it all to you. I pray, Lord God, that we would do exactly that. That you indeed would change us from the inside out. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In your holy name, amen.